pollution, there'll be no pollution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. Happy Pride Month. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gabrielle Hakoen. I'm here with my BFF and co-host, cult expert, cult survivor, Sadie Carpenter. Sadie, happy Pride. How are you doing today? Good morning. Happy Pride. I am so glad to be here today and to be starting off our yearly celebration of Pride Month. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, this is, I think, when we make some of the best content of the year, in my opinion. And, and I, I, I love the episodes that we do during this month. And this month, we have so much good stuff coming for you to celebrate the pride and the joy that is um, queerness, gayness, lesbianness, transness, all of those things, all of those positive things that we see as positive and good things because we like to affirm people here. I've I've never heard the term lesbianness before, but I appreciate your <laughs> allyship, Gavi. Yeah, hey, look, man, there's a lot of people out here being hateful, as we're going to talk about today. And yeah. I think that it's very important to just try to be as positive about people as possible, to especially when they're under attack like they are right now. So long story, speaking of being under attack, long story short, um, I pissed off a homophobe about three years ago this month. And we were planning on doing like one or two episodes in June of 2021 for pride month but we weren't going to make it a whole month and then i pissed off a homophobe and uh we decided to make an entire month of content both shining a light on the difficulties that lgbtq people face in the world today and also highlighting queer joy and uh celebrating the celebrating the things that we have gained this week we're talking about one of the most uh, prominent and and most famous anti-lgbtq hate groups that there is which is the westboro baptist church out of topeka kansas they're not very cool we don't like them next week however we have an interview that we we, we recorded about a week ago and honestly like this interview is one of the best things that I think we've ever possibly done on this show. It was so good. We had an interview with Pastor Noah Hepler. You know him if you've watched uh, Netflix's Queer Eye. He was one of the heroes from season five of Queer Eye when they were in Philadelphia. They uh, He was a pastor at a church, a gay pastor at a church who uh, was raised in fundamentalism and he left fundamentalism. And now he pastors an affirming ministry in Philadelphia. And we had a conversation with him about a week ago. That's going to be next week's episode. And we're talking about everything from affirming theology and just like what it was like to be on Queer Eye and what it was like to, you know, get your eyebrows done by Jonathan Van Ness. So that's going to be really fun as well. And we'll have more interviews, more in-depth topics as the month goes on. Uh, wanted to let people know that our Pride merch is live on Threadless. Yes, you can go and order those, uh, or order shirts, order t-shirts, order order uh, sweatshirts, order baby clothes, order child sizes. We have them in child sizes. Oh no, we're grooming children. If any chuds yeah. have a problem with that, then I would kindly like to tell you that you can go like... If you're a chud, don't listen to our show. Um, I'm going to do my whole spiel for the before we get into that, and then we can get into the meat of this episode. So, as always, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult, the cult in which she was raised. We talk about this cult, we talk about other cults, we talk about religion, we talk about fundamentalism, we talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole, and it is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, then you can can 
join our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast, where there will be an extended uncensored ad free version of most of our episodes, including this episode. They also come out a day early. So if you can't wait until Monday to get the episode, then you can get it on Sunday on our Patreon. Subscribe to the Patreon. You can join our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Also, just make sure you hit that like, that subscribe, that that follow button wherever you get your podcasts, because we have some great new content coming out. As we said, we talked about the Pride content. We also have an episode coming out later this week that's going to be about shiny, happy people, uh, the Duggars doc that's coming out on amazon prime that's out by now on amazon prime we are we are going to interview at least one person who was involved in that documentary yeah hmm. we're gonna we're gonna have a really good time we will get that episode out just as soon as we are able to watch the whole thing and sit down with our guests or guests now i'm just going to thank the faith promise missions and i gave it all to your patrons i'm gonna try to forgive me if i blow through you guys a little bit quickly uh but we have a long episode to do our two i gave it all to your patrons are kathleen moncrief and melissa mosley thank you guys so much for supporting our show our faith promise missions to your patrons names are alex p alex todd alicia guild ali allen anisha patel ashley Doxtator, brooke tolly Krissa, Crystal Patterson, Dear Ethan Hansen, the musical, Dora J, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fairlosser, Enchanted Fairy, Esther M, Hannah Ross, Hope Norum, Horton, Here's a Shane, Janine Collin, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jonna, Justin, Kat Henwood, Kay Terwee, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Lorena Watson, Madeline Cusick, Marlena Stuve, Marsha Millard. I think Marsha Millard's new. Is Marsha Millard new? I think that's a new one. Thank you so much, Marsha. I think so. Welcome, Marsha. Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arendt, Rob the Methodist, Sarah Reese, Scooby Sleuth, Stephanie Johnson, Susie, Tara McNamara, Tiffany Enderby, and Wes the Cowboy. Thank you guys so much. Sadie, hit us with a TW for the episode, and then we can get right into it. Uh, in general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we'll mention at least a few of these topics, but we try to avoid any graphic detail unless it's relevant to the story we're telling. And if we are going to include that kind of detail, we will give the audience a heads up before we do so. This episode, to no one's surprise, carries a very strong trigger warning for homophobia. Uh, it, there are also trigger warnings for misogyny, transphobia, toxic theology, anti-Semitism, abortion, street preaching, and the deaths of soldiers at war. I don't think any of that will be a surprise to anyone who clicked on the episode title. We have made it our policy not to repeat slurs in this podcast. And of course, our topic today is a group that is best known for using slurs. What we're going to do today is we will make reference to the slurs that these people used. Uh, we will not be and we'll be talking about these things as sensitively as we can, but we won't repeat the actual words that they use. We'll give you a heads up before anything especially heinous. One of the other traditions that we have for Pride Month, which is a tradition that I love so much, is that we get the stories from our listeners and we read them on the air um, from from queer listeners, from LGBTQIA2 plus listeners, and we read them on the air. I'm going to read one of these stories. Is that cool? Yeah, that sounds amazing. We got so many this month that I have not actually been able to read them all yet. So this one might be a surprise to me. <laughs> Yeah, so this one's um actually just came in under the wire, like right before we're like, okay, now is the cutoff. We can't accept them anymore. But this one is from Summer. Uh, and Summer writes to us, Hey y'all, first things first, great podcast. Thanks to Sadie's story. Halfway through episode one, I discovered that I was raised by two fundies, which explains some of the batch I've been trying to rework slash therapize in my life. And thanks to Gavi. I got a sweet confirmation that my entire extended family uh, and the way I was raised are truly not normal. Thank you for listening, Summer. Now for the juicy bits. Happy almost Pride Month 
My super religious family had me thinking that gay people were the root of most evil. See, that's why I picked the story for today, because they have something in common with our topic for today. My super religious family had me thinking that gay people were the root, the root of most evil to the extent that comments and channel changes were made any time a queer coded character came on a TV as a kid. Wow. Talk about snowflakes. Paired with that awful bias, mom would sometimes tell me how she'd prayed a wall of protection around my heart so I'd never date the wrong man. I tease her about that now. She's embarrassed enough at raising us more fundy than she realized that she doesn't find it quite as funny as I do that I turned out to be asexual, <laughs> to be an asexual woman who just as likely to date anyone based on their personality, not their gender. Well, mom's <laughs> prayers came true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was the funny thing, though. Thanks to purity culture unrealistic expectations and a tens and a tendency to think i was normal i was the most undercover gay kid so much so i didn't even realize i was bi slash ace until about four years ago wow me being ace well obviously i was just great at that whole no sex before marriage thing but good lord it was horrifying walking into a high school full of horny teenage <laughs> sinners every day and surely every girl appreciated pretty woman it's just women supporting women obviously there wasn't any reason to suspect otherwise since i had my transient little crushes on the cute boys in class ha it feels a little bit sketchy to be openly or loudly queer when I'm not around my other gay or supportive friends. That sucks. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm doing that just fine. In the last couple years, I've done a lot of growing and rewiring of old ideas, and I'm less scared of being kicked out of family situations due to being gay. Sadie, I just wanted to say a special thanks for being open about all of this, including your PTSD. It's been good seeing someone else has handled I've got that that good old CPTSD and how you've gotten yourself to a level footing and I'm sorting through my triggers and learning better management techniques it's all about parallel journeys all the best of you summer well thank you so much summer and I always appreciate when people want to thank me for being so open about especially my PTSD my experiences I don't ever want to be like toxic positivity mental health content like just oh just do this thing just sleep more just eat a better diet just exercise just uh whatever take this medication and you'll be fine but i do want to show people that hey i've been able to build a great life a fantastic life living with ptsd it's not something that you can cure or it, it and it doesn't ever completely go away but it is something that you can live a happy life after having. So I always appreciate when people seem to make that distinction the way that I do. And thank you so much for your story. Well, that's awesome. That was a great story. Um, I'm going to do my whole spiel for the before we get into that, and then we can get into the meat of this episode. But we, I wanted to put that story right at the front because I thought it was a little bit relevant to what we were talking about today. Yeah, so Westboro Baptist Church, Topeka, Kansas. Their uh, founder was Fred Phelps. He is no longer living. Well-known hate group. Yeah, this dude sucks. Uh, major butthole. We don't like him at all. Not a cool guy. Uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, the Westboro Baptist Church, a bit of their history, what they actually believe. And at the end of the episode, we're going to play a game of grifter or true believer. Sometimes when we get we, we've done that with like Bob Larson. We've done that with um, a few other like cult leaders. Like we did that, I think, with Jim Jones and we did that with David Koresh. But we're going to play a game of grifter or true believer to decide whether or not they actually believe the things that they were saying or they were just people trying to make a quick buck off of hate. Yeah, I want to talk for like half a minute about why we're doing Westboro during Pride Month because they are just such a terrible hate group. So I'm hearing from friends and people I follow on Twitter, et cetera, that Pride Month has been a really hard thing to navigate over the last few years. The LGBTQ plus community wants to celebrate their resilience and show their joy and celebrate their identity. But there's this dark cloud of things getting worse and in many states, much, much worse for LGBTQ people. 
And I'm a queer person myself, but I have this immense privilege. Not only do I live somewhere where I'm very safe being out in public about my identity, but I'm also in a straight appearing marriage and I've chosen to bear a child and people can easily write me off as, oh, that's just a binary cishet person. So I don't want to take that privilege lightly and just do content that's all sunshine and rainbows when the world of being an LGBTQ person is far from sunshine and rainbows for so many others. I also don't want to fail to make pride a protest, but I also don't want to make it doom and gloom and miss the celebration. So just like last year, what we're trying to bring you this month is a mix of both. And I truly believe that digging into this kind of hate group can be helpful and can be healing. It demystifies and it pulls back the curtain so that we can see the small and hateful and petty human beings behind the hate group. It can also be helpful because it reveals the tactics that hateful people use to try to hurt others. And that prepares us to fight against those specific tactics. So Westboro Baptist Church, they are categorized as a hate group by pretty much everybody. They're well known for their antics of showing up to places with signs reading, God hates um, F slur, God hates Jews, uh, thank God for dead soldiers, things like that. They'll go out of their way to provoke people into a physical confrontation, and then often they will file lawsuits against people who physically attack them and then make money doing that. They most notoriously deploy this strategy at funerals for armed service members who were killed during the line of duty. So when we started researching this episode, I thought that what we would find is that Fred Phelps, founder of Westboro Baptist Church, would be something similar to either like Peter Ruckman or Steven Anderson. Yeah. Right? Right. I was thinking like, oh, somewhere between Ruckman and Anderson is where he's got to be. Right. What I was not expecting to find out is that Fred Phelps, who was the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church, the guy who's like responsible for all of this, was a practicing civil rights attorney who played a not insignificant role in the desegregation of the state of Kansas in the late 1960s. I'm sorry, he was a who who did what? Yes. Fred Phelps, born in 1929 in Meridian, Mississippi, very religious as a child, extremely devoted to the letter of the law of the Bible, extremely fundamentalist. He was ordained as a minister by the Southern Baptist Convention at the age of 17. Um, he was also hmm. accepted into West Point, but rather than going for a career in the military, he decided to go for a career in the ministry. And so he attended Bob Jones College before it was Bob Jones University in order to pursue this goal. So like I said earlier, Fred Phelps was extremely strict with his beliefs, so much so that he essentially ended his relationship with his own father because his father was divorced and remarried. This trait would also follow him through his life because after just one year at Bob Jones College, he dropped out and moved to California to become a street preacher because I think he, he didn't think that they were serious enough was the impression that I mm -hmm. got from reading about this. Fun story about how he became a street preacher is that he moved to California and was attending community college there. And his biblical legalistic attitude earned him the frustration of his professors and his classmates. Like he had zero chill. He would just openly berate people for their sins. And when the administration basically told him, you can't berate people for their sins while you're on campus, he just picked up and moved across the street and just started being a street preacher like across the street from the college campus it's <laughs> hmm. yeah so um he married uh margie marie sims in 1952 i guess she became margie marie phelps um in 1954 they had a child of uh, fred phelps jr they settled in topeka kansas so i was looking for information as to why fred phelps a southern baptist fundamentalist white man from meridian mississippi would decide to become a civil rights attorney and th this is really interesting to that is really interesting i'm a little bit stunned by just the beginning of the story here this this story is so wild so he was so fundamentalist that he ended his relationship with his dad because his dad got divorced and remarried yes so this is a guy who loves the letter of the law. Yes. And I assume is like really, really biblical literalist as well. Yes. And then he devoted a bunch of his time to yelling at people in public over their sins or what he assumed their sins were. OK, 
Okay, so the street preaching, which usually amounts to yelling at people about what you think their sins are, isn't what I would call unbiblical or extra biblical in the sense that this behavior appears in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Although the New Testament gives us many other options for dealing with sins in other people, including not judging, Matthew 7 1, and privately confronting others about known sin, Matthew chapter 18. The, the whole yelling at people in public about sins is really something that we associate more with Old Testament prophets, which makes me wonder if we're going to get to, oh yeah, by the way, I'm a prophet. Uh. So what I'm getting, yeah, which I feel like is going to, what I want to make clear is there is not a specific commandment, even in a highly literal interpretation of Christian scripture, that requires you to go yell at people on the street about their sins. When Westboro Baptist Church talks about this on their website, they cite, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, teaching them to observe all things where wherewith I have commanded you, which most Christians will refer to as the Great Commission. That verse doesn't say yell at people about their sins. It says preach the gospel. This is not only a biblical literalist tank. This goes deeper than that, if that makes sense. I have some, I'm already starting on some theories, but I'll, I'll hold on to them for a minute and circle back after a little bit more of his life story. The, the question I want to answer now is why Fred Phelps became a civil rights attorney. And this, this part is really interesting. In 1954, Fred Phelps accepted a job as a pastor of a Baptist church in Topeka, Kansas. The day he, his wife, Margie, and his son, Fred Jr., arrived in Topeka was the 4th of May, 1954. Coincidentally, this was the same day that the United States Supreme Court handed down the monumental decision in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education. This decision ruled that segregated schools for black and white children was not constitutional. And the original lawsuit that started that case was against the Board of Education for Topeka, Kansas. So Phelps arrives in Topeka on this historic day in both American history and Topeka history. So Phelps viewed this as a sign from God that he was meant to be here and that this was his calling and that this was what God wanted him to do. Of all the supposed signs from God that I've ever heard of, this is far from the most questionable. Yeah. This, this is actually a pretty good sign from God compared to some other things that I've heard. Yeah. So, I mean, Phelps was originally hired for Eastside Baptist Church which was Southern Baptist Convention. In 1955, Eastside Baptist Church put Phelps in charge of a new church plant, which was called the Westboro Baptist Church, which was just basically a church plant that was associated with, it's like a sub-church to their church, but it was like in a different neighborhood. Immediately after it was established and, and Phelps had his ministry, he officially like got this new church and he cut ties with Eastside Baptist Church and the Southern Baptist Convention and turned Westboro Baptist Church into an independent Baptist church. So he took their money for the church plant and ran. Yes. Phelps, basically his his hard preaching style, as well his, as his combination of both IFB and Calvinist theology, upset almost everybody who was a member at that church. And so most of the congregation decided that they were going to leave and go back to Eastside Baptist. That seems smart. <laughs> so during this time, uh, Phelps also attended Washburn University for law school and passed the Kansas State Bar Exam. And in 1964, he founded his own law firm and started practicing civil rights law. And in 1973, he was able to represent Evelyn Renee Johnson, who was a 10-year-old black child who was suing the Topeka Board of Education because they didn't actually really desegregate their schools, even though they were told to by the Supreme Court. The school board settled the case. Fred Phelps was given awards by the local NAACP chapter for his work in civil rights law, which is crazy to think about. That You know what? We all make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just wild stuff. So the thing that I want to point out here, though, is that Phelps' motivation for this seems kind of questionable. In speaking to CNN, his 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 estranged son, who is now an LGBTQ rights activist, a man named Nate Phelps, 
uh, who's Fred Phelps' son, alleges that Fred basically took on these cases because nobody else would take the cases and he needed work. So in order to financially support his church, the attendance of which was like, it was never very good. Like Phelps was having to resort to having his children sell candy door to door. And like they were selling this candy and then Westboro Baptist Church got sued multiple times by multiple different candy companies because he didn't pay them for the candy. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, so like this this church was broke as sh they were very financially very dire and like that was basically during the period of time when fred phelps lost his license to practice law so they had to sell candy like basically they didn't have any money and nate phelps alleges that his father would take these cases from like black clients and litigate them very well because he's a very legalistic person and he knows the letter of the law very well and he would gain a reputation for being very good at it but that in private he would use racial slurs to describe them he would insult their intelligence and just generally be racist and horrible oh no yeah oh no that's that's awful that just turns my stomach to hear about well so this allegation was disputed by fred's granddaughter megan phelps roper who claims that her father was motivated because he was horrified by the things that he saw done to black people growing up in meridian mississippi in the 30s and 40s however i'm personally inclined to believe nate on this one because the quote from megan phelps roper when she said that was from 2010 which is several years before she actually left westboro baptist church and if you want evidence of this in her denial of nate's claims this is this is a quote for you from megan phelps roper she says nathan is a tortured soul he has no grace god had no mercy upon him he's hardened his heart <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, the things that you would see happening if you grew up in Meridian, Mississippi in the 1930s and 1940s, if you were a person who had a lot of compassion, you would be able to look at those things and go, huh, that's clearly wrong. Maybe I should do something about that. Um, but that would require you having a heart and a soul. And I'm not that convinced about Fred Phelps. Yeah, considering that this is something that Megan the Turf Ooh. said before she left the church, uh, I would not believe any of that uh, or anything that she said before she left. Basically, only listen to Megan Phelps Roper between the years of like 2014 and 2019, 2020. <laughs> what I wanted to point out is that this man had 13 children. And the majority of them were born during this time frame that we're talking about between the founding of Westboro Baptist Church and during his law career, if you can call it that. So what I wanted to point out is the invisible work of his wife that is not put into words in this story. Like this woman was out there having 13 children while he was doing all of this. I don't want to shame working parents ever because uh, working parents are amazing. But I personally think that pastoring a church and also running a law firm probably didn't leave him a lot of time to be an engaged dad. So throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, Fred Phelps had a streak of what I can only describe as like bizarro world evil twin ACLU style lawsuits. Like, so he would sue on behalf of women facing sex discrimination in the world in the workplace. He would sue. He sued the Reagan administration. This is a funny one. He sued the Ronald Reagan administration, alleging that appointing an ambassador to the Vatican violated the First Amendment. Wild suit there. He also sued the power company and the utility companies for providing poorer services in black neighborhoods. I am sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I know this is my podcast and I'm supposed to talk, but this is all just so like out beyond what I was expecting. I thought I was going to find out. Oh, this dude was a fundy. Here's the college he went to. This is what kind of fundy he was. I wasn't expecting to be like, what is this guy's deal? No, okay. So here's the thing, though. This is where we get to the crazy. So Fred Phelps was disbarred from the Kansas lower courts in 1979 following an incident that occurred during a lawsuit. Phelps filed a lawsuit against a court reporter who didn't deliver him a transcript as quickly as he would have liked a personal suit. Yeah. He personally, because apparently, huh. uh, uh, 
but apparently it didn't actually have an effect on the outcome of the case. He just didn't get it within the amount of time that he really wanted it. So the, the court reporter was a woman named uh, Caroline Brady. And he, Fred Phelps called Caroline Brady to the stand, and then he went on an extended tirade of personal attack, like slut shaming, just truly vitriolic language. If you read about this case, it's nuts. And this was so out of line that he was disbarred for it and no longer allowed to practice law in lower courts. But his disbarment, I guess, only applied to like the lower courts in like Kansas State. So he was allowed to practice law in federal court for the time being. Yeah, for the time being, which I guess. Ugh. I guess it makes sense the tack that he would take as far as like the direction that he would take his church because then he's like, okay, well, I can just pivot hard into like First Amendment stuff. I'm glad you brought this incident up because it, it really does add a dimension when we're trying to guess at why he is the way he is. Like we know before we started this episode, everybody knows that he's a, a hateful man who hates all LGBTQ people of every kind. But this is an example of him using the witness stand in a civil trial as a tool to humiliate and harm other people. So he's, it's not like he's like a passionate fan of the justice system. <laughs> it's more like he's a passionate fan of his using his knowledge of the justice system in order to try to gain more personal power. He's just a very self-serving person. And he has yeah. and, and he has a license to practice law. And so he's going to just take out his personal vendetta against whoever he feels like deserves it. I remembered what I was going to say earlier as well. So we're talking about him pastoring a church full time, raising money for the church through taking on all of these higher profile lawsuits in the state of Kansas. Um, like suing the Board of Education, suing power companies. In 1989, the Westboro Baptist Church started protesting homosexuality. Westboro Baptist Church would free. So this is where the this is where their bread and butter basically started, uh, and what we know them for now. Um, and how they kind of vaulted themselves onto the national stage. But the Westboro Baptist Church would frequently picket on behalf of causes that Phelps would litigate for generally before then but now in 1989 they started protesting homosexuality using very vitriolic language using slurs crude language and they draw widespread condemnation from pretty much everybody so even in the early 1990s when um lgbtq rights were nowhere near as widely accepted as they were today um as they are today the legal protections were even worse what phelps and the westboro baptist church were doing was seen as over the line by like everybody they were hated by liberal people who saw them as hateful and they were also hated by christians who thought that they gave christians a bad name and even like mainline fundamentalists who maybe they wouldn't have totally disagreed with the idea that god condemns gays to hell they would have thought that the westboro baptist church's posters and their language was too vulgar and not representative of how they wanted christians to be seen so phelps really kind of bought into the whole secondary separation aspect of this condemnation and felt that the amount of condemnation that they were getting was indicative that they were doing something right and that it was proof of their righteousness. Phelps would like continue this stunt. He would eventually go so far as to protest military funerals. And this actually led to several laws being passed in states which placed restrictions on protests nearby to military cemeteries. And the federal government also passed a law banning protests at the Arlington National Cemetery. So I had always thought that they protested military funerals because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Like they were mad that the military allowed LGBTQ people to be in the military at all. And they thought that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was way too liberal because and I conflated that because that was the opinion of a lot of fundies that I grew up with. But now it like it seems like they're protesting because God killed this young man to pay for the sins of America. Is that more correct? Yeah, I think I think it's more the second one, but it's sort of like the way that I would describe it. It's sort of like, you know how anti-vax people, every time they see that somebody's 83 year old grandpa dies of a heart attack, they're like, what was his vaccination status? Right. Sure. It's kind of like that. It's like every time a U.S. soldier dies, they say it was because of the gays. He had a gay next door neighbor. Like that's the or, or right. I mean, I remember when we had our listeners write in, um, we talked about Calvinism 
around the time we talked about Ginger Duggar's book. And we asked our listeners to write in their experiences with Calvinism, whether they were positive or whether they were negative. Because uh, as we'll get to later, the Westboro Baptist Church is, a, they're Calvinist in their belief. And one letter that we got was one saying that from somebody saying that they had the teaching, well, the world is corrupted by sin, which is why nothing is perfect. And this is self-evident throughout the world. People aren't perfect. Plants aren't perfect. Animals aren't perfect. Environment isn't perfect. And that's why Jesus' sacrifice is necessary. This isn't that. This is like a cracked out extreme version of that combined with the fundy teaching that God is like moments away from revoking his grace he's like at the end of his rope and he's like if you guys don't shape up right now then i'm going to rain down hellfire on you so it's like those two beliefs uh that's it back to winnipeg yeah <laughs> like god is he's like constantly that dad from the simpsons one more if you put one more toe out of one, like that's the so i i did finally i found an interview after i dug through some survivor interviews especially libby phelps the reasoning that Westboro gives to their members for why they protest military funerals is basically no one should be fighting for such a wicked nation. That's the, the shift in Phelps teaching that happened around 1990 from like, we support the military and they're doing their best out there. Uh, he very quickly shifted to around 1990. He very quickly shifted to, well, this is a wicked nation and therefore anyone who defends it is wicked. Did you read it all about? why they originally started protesting like the concept of being gay to begin with was it because he i th he found out about like gay bathhouses or something or he found out about glory there, holes yeah there was a, a a cruising park there was a, a cruising park like not far from the church and that the idea that such a thing existed upset him so greatly <laughs> that he started to petition the city to clean up our parks and protect the moral character of our, like, that was his tack. And um, the city was like, yeah, sure, we'll send extra patrols out there, whatever. And um, he was so enraged by the city, the city's response. And that uh, seems to be how he got obsessed with queer people above all else um, in his protesting, which uh, I bring up because that's just so petty. <laughs> That's extremely That's just petty. A, it's just a, a small thing to do, you know? Like, oh no, people are doing things that I don't like when I am not there and can't see them doing it, but sort of close to my house, and I can't take that, and I want city government to fix it. And city government provides a solution that is harmful to the people that I hate. Uh, but it's not harmful enough, so I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to hurt people's feelings back over it. Well, if they weren't petty, they wouldn't be the Westboro Baptist Church, and they wouldn't be <laughs> fundamentalists, and they wouldn't be fundamentalists if they weren't up in everybody's business all the time trying to tell people how they have to live. It's like <laughs> it's just when we, you know, we talk about when we talk about Westboro, they are such and Fred Phelps, they are such beacons of hatred. They are such high profile haters they're such high profile nasty nasty people and that can make them feel powerful because they're so loud and they get media attention they get amplified by so many different sources um even we're doing an episode about them even though amplification is not what we're trying to do here i think it's helpful to look at oh this is so petty oh this is this is just such a whiny thing to do because that, I think that takes some of their power away. It demystifies it a little bit. As far as like the why do we protest thing, like the way that they would put it, uh, I spent some time on the Westboro Baptist Church website, which is not linked in my sources due to the fact that there is a slur in the website name. Terrible web design too. <sighs> uh, it, it sucked for me typing this website in. <clears throat> I should probably burn my computer because my algorithm is done. But I want to read this from their about page because I thought this was interesting. So here's their quote. We adhere to the teachings of the Bible, preach against all forms of sin, e.g. fornication, adultery, including divorce and remarriage, sodomy, preach, preach repentance and remission of sins in Christ's name, and insist that the sovereignty of God and the doctrines of grace be taught and expounded publicly to all men. 
So I, what I want to zero in on is, is they say all forms of sin, parentheses, fornication, adultery, sodomy. <laughs> because in the IFB, the list would go. Like, the IFB are obsessed and focused on what they call sexual sins. But in the IFB, that list would go something like fornication, adultery, sodomy, drunkenness, Hollywood, immorality, rock music. Do you, do you see the difference there? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm so used to the IFB world where, of course, there's a huge focus on quote unquote sexual sins. And that's a primary concern, but it's always followed by a laundry list of other sins. Westboro Baptist Church says all forms of sin. And then their list is all <laughs> so-called sexual sins. Their propensity for protesting funerals has led to lawsuits. So one case, Snyder v. Phelps made it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. So Matthew Snyder was a lance corporal in the U.S. Marine Corps. He was killed in the line of duty. Westboro Baptist Church protested his funeral. His family successfully sued the Westboro Baptist Church for emotional distress. The suit, however, was reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court in a... Uh, uh, an eight to one decision, which ruled that the Westboro Baptist Church had the right to protest a funeral for a fallen Marine in as vulgar way as they like because of freedom of speech in the First Amendment. Yeah. And then that's why there were laws passed that I think we're going to talk about later in the episode that set limits like yeah, a protest has to be 300 yards from a military funeral or a protest you can protest a military funeral up to two hours before the start time and two hours after it finishes that kind of thing yeah so they they're like well we can't tell you you can't do it but here's some restrictions basically to keep you out of the and those are i guess deemed more reasonable by the courts but yeah so uh, fred phelps died of natural causes on march 9th 2014 at the age of 84 we're going to get into some of the circumstances surrounding his death and his status within the church a little later but Westboro Baptist Church still exists. They still do their protests. They don't have very many people, although they never really had very many people. They're, uh, it's part of the reason why they had to keep pulling these crazy stunts to try to make money. I think that in 2016, their membership was estimated at around like 70, which seems like a lot of people to be in this cult slash hate group. But all things considered, that's not a very big church. That's a, that's a well, Phelps started out with 13 children. And nine of them, as far as I know, are still members. So 70 people was mostly his children and grandchildren. Yes. One other thing of note, very wild. Fred Phelps ran for governor of Kansas three times and a U.S. senator one time. All four times he ran for elected office, he ran for the Democratic primary. Very wild. He ran for governor in Fred Phelps and William Jennings Bryan <laughs> and unsuccessful Democratic... <sighs> runs for office well william jennings bryan made it out of the primary fred phelps well, never made william it out jennings of bryan is somebody i'd much rather speak to no but fred phelps ran for governor in 1990 1994 and 1998 and he ran for senate in 1992 never even won a primary although in his senate run he managed 30 percent of the vote in the democratic primary which is i assume people going off of his civil rights background and not his everything else background but like fifty thousand people voted for this dude i guess he did he did show a talent for pr uh senate run in 1992 that's before most people had a home computer yes so they wouldn't necessarily have been able to google him and pull up dozens and dozens of examples of hate speech yes so considering his talent for getting attention and his talent for writing his own pr I assume that those had something to do with how he got 30% of the primary vote. So we're going to go take up the offering and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about their theology and some of the more of the protests, more of the counter protests, that kind of thing. Including some of my favorite people who have owned the Westboro Baptist Church with counter protests. Very exciting. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, 
That group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. I was raised in a cult. Of course, if you'd have asked me all those years ago or anyone else in our small fundamentalist church if we were a cult, we'd have indignantly replied, absolutely not. Other groups like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, they're cults, but we're not a cult. Everything became normalized, though, but it wasn't until decades later, after I deconstructed my entire belief system and walked away from the Christian faith entirely, that I began to see just how cultish the whole thing actually was. But before all of that, for over 20 years, I'd served both as a pastor and a Bible college teacher, so I had a hand in it, furthering the toxicity also. So in the process of rebuilding my life and discovering my authentic identity, I've got lots to work through, things like religious trauma syndrome, rapture anxiety, and just so much more. Join me, Dr. Clint Haycock, on the Mind Shift podcast as we take a look at such topics as cult tactics and psychology, religious trauma syndrome and religious addiction, taking your life back after leaving a cult or high control group, and finally, dominion theology and the dangers posed by the Christian right, not just in America, but indeed the world. You can find my show on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. Who knows, it might just be time for a mind check. We are back from our break. We've talked about the history of the Westboro Baptist Church, some of the major things that they've been involved in. The second half of the episode, we're going to get into like what they actually believe, what they actually teach, and some of the more notable protests and counter-protests, which should be fun. So let's do some theology. Go for it. Westboro Baptist Church are primitive Baptists. Um, primitive Baptists are, they consider it's primitive because it's old school. Like they consider themselves the original Baptists and they are generally very Calvinist less leaning, although they would probably say reformed rather than Calvinist. Westboro is an independent Baptist church, similar in tradition to what you might have heard referred to as foot washing Baptists. They describe themselves as adhering to the five points of tulip. And yes, um, independent Calvinist or Reformed Baptist churches are absolutely a real thing. When I say that a church can be independent and Baptist without being a part of the IFB, I'm often referencing churches that we would call better or less toxic than the IFB, but sometimes churches can be independent and Baptist and not part of the IFB and worse than the IFB. So theologically, Westboro holds to the theological teachings of total depravity, all humans are completely sinful, unconditional election, so God chose before the beginning of time who would be saved and who would go to hell, limited atonement, uh, meaning that Jesus didn't die for everyone, but instead Jesus died only for those who would receive salvation, irresistible grace, so those who God chose to be saved are unable to choose not to be saved and perseverance of the saints. So those who are truly saved and chosen by God will be faithful until the end of their lives. As we've talked about on this podcast, there are logical and ideologically consistent and compassionate forms of Calvinist teaching and reform teaching. Those teachings don't work for my worldview and the way that I think about God, but that doesn't mean that anything with the label Calvinist or reformed or tulip is inherently toxic or harmful. It's just different from my personal thinking. I think it should be really clear to our audience, though, how this can be applied in a way that is problematic and harmful, which, of course, is what I would say of the Westboro Baptist Church. I have a very brief trigger warning for mention of abortion here. It's really short. So where this gets theologically interesting has to do with a common like gotcha Twitter argument that gets tossed around in abortion discussions. You will see people say something like, well, your God doesn't hate killing babies. He did it dozens of times in the Bible. The Westboro Baptist Church interestingly says, actually, yeah, God does not love everyone. Actually, God hates most people. <laughs> And they're citing the same sources as those gotcha Twitter people, like dozens of instances in scripture of God pronouncing judgment or ordering the deaths of people or people groups. 
Their teaching is that God hates not just quote unquote sinners like gay people, but God hates everyone who is not one of the elect. So God hates good people who are not elect. They also teach that Jesus only died for those who are elect and that people cannot choose salvation for themselves. Only God can make the choice of who will receive salvation and who will not. They also have the teaching that Westboro Baptist Church and churches in close alignment with them are the only people who are elect. So that's like Baptist bridalism. Yeah, except for more. And it just so happens that no churches are in close alignment with them. So they teach that they are the only elect. <laughs> Anytime a, a very small group tells you we are the only ones who are going to heaven, that is a sure sign of a cult. <laughs> and this probably also has to do with their interpretation of perseverance of saints. So a church that believes similarly to them, but doesn't go out picketing or street preaching, my, my guess is maybe they cite the perseverance of the saints and say, well, they're not doing the work of God. So they were clearly never elect to begin with. Aside from the tulip teachings that they adhere to, I was able to pick up some other little bits of their teachings from interviews with ex-members. I read an interview with Lauren Drain, who is an excommunicated Westboro Baptist Church member who has written a book about her experience. Lauren's dad, Steve Drain, was making a documentary on Westboro Baptist Church, but when he visited the church for a while to make this documentary, he accidentally joined them. Man. That's terrible. Like, he was making a documentary to expose their hatred. And then he went to visit them and came out of it believing that they were right. That's terrifying. That, that's <laughs> wild. As a cult researcher, that is terrifying. Somebody um, tell Ross and Carrie. <clears throat> <laughs> Ross and Carrie just joined the cults. It's fine. Yeah. It's on purpose. So I'm going to get to a lot more of Lauren's story later in this episode. But Lauren said that after she left, she was afraid that God would do something to her, like send her a terrible illness because she was sinful or because she had left the church. But that's like very run-of-the-mill fundy deconstruction stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So now you've talked about this, the, the, the tulip beliefs and their kind of like evil perversion of these beliefs, or at least their um, interpretation of them in a very hateful way. I don't want to say that yeah, I, I, I mean, don't want to say that these beliefs are automatically good or automatically bad, but their their interpretation of these beliefs in a very hateful way. You want to do Sadie's metaphor corner? <laughs> yeah. If if the if these beliefs are a hammer and somebody uses them to build, I don't know, a building that I don't like, a building that I think is like bad architecture, that's none of my business. But if these beliefs are a hammer and somebody uses them to hit somebody else in the head, that suddenly becomes my business and something that I'm a lot more willing to call out. Like beliefs are neutral, but they can be used in helpful or harmful way. Many beliefs are neutral and can be used in helpful or harmful ways. Yeah. So I want to, now that we've talked about those specific things, I want to go into a little bit of detail because I want to talk about um, a train of thought that exists within Christianity that is also central to the Westboro Baptist Church's me uh, message um, and this teaching um, in certain segments of Christianity, this this teaching is that calamitous events like, you know, natural disasters, terrorism, plague, that sort of thing. Those are all vengeance from a just God who is punishing man for his sins or for his tolerance of sins. And this teaching comes from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, in which God destroys the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because they are places that are known to be sinful. The idea that God can and might destroy a group of people, a nation, a family, whatever, because they're intractably sinful is not uncommon in Christianity. I would point out that even the Noah's Flood narrative has the same idea. But this teaching has a lot of potential to be taken to extremes. So what Westboro Baptist Church and the mainstream IFB have in common is the teaching that America is too sinful right now and could attract the judgment of God at any moment. And like Gavi said, anything disastrous that happens to America as a nation from national dis or natural disasters or terrorism to a plane crash is a small dose of God's judgment to come. It's a warning, like uh, 
you better straighten up because there's more where that came from. Another thing that the IFB and Westboro would believe in common is that a personal disaster in your life, like the death of a loved one, a car accident, damage or destruction of your home, anything like that, can also be the judgment of God coming down on you for your personal sin. What I can say is that the Westboro Baptist Church takes this teaching in a very different direction that I didn't hear in the IFB growing up. Where Westboro Baptist Church adds on further to this teaching is that they teach that a personal tragedy, especially the death of a loved one or the death of a military person, can be a small dose of God's judgment on a sinful country. Like your your loved one who is in the military didn't necessarily die because of your sin. Maybe they died because of the whole country's sin, but you are bearing the punishment. So personally, I think that if you're going to teach this kind of thing, you're going to have a lot of difficulty getting extremely conservative people, like even IFB level conservative people to buy into the whole thank God for dead soldiers message. Because I think like most people in this country see members of armed services as people who are more selfless, more service minded, especially, you know, uh, so, so the reticence to accept this belief is more to do specifically with the idea of it being U.S. soldiers targeted for God's wrath than it is God exerting his wrath on mankind due to the sinfulness of people living in cities or whatever. Because as we've said before, this idea was promoted by Jerry Falwell following 9-11 and Pat Robertson following Hurricane Katrina. They both said that that was due to like sinfulness of the country. Both of those uh, events, they said, were due to sinfulness of the country. So, And those are much more mainstream fundamentalists who are pushing a version of this teaching. They're, right. I guess they just like stop short of, oh, well, the soldiers are dying because of the gays. Um, right. So that's, that's where Westboro Baptist Church like goes on their own tangent to the mainstream belief because the idea of like, oh, this hurricane happened because we're a sinful country and God chose to punish us or this terrorist act happened because we're a sinful country and God chose to punish us. Like that's mainstream, but God killed this particular soldier because we're a sinful country is the the unique tangent that the Westboro Baptist Church takes. The thing that confuses me about this belief is so as we said earlier, um, as Sadie so very well illuminated, Westboro Baptist Church is full tulip five-point Calvinist. Um, we, we talked about this in our episode in January about Calvinism. This means that God pretty much has determined before anybody was even born what is going to happen in people's lives with regards to what happens in their lives, whether they get saved, whether they go to heaven, whether they go to hell. However, the Westboro Baptist Church's belief in God engaging in collective punishment of large groups of people combined with the five points of Calvinism is a truly bizarre prospect because essentially this version of God would create a world of sinners, but some sins are so heinous that everybody in the city or the country where those people live would be punished for those sins and people who lived or, or hundreds or like thousands of miles away who didn't have anything to do with those sins would also get punished for them and that people's lives on earth would be destroyed because of like imagine living in Iowa and God decides that you should get brain cancer because somebody in Arizona is gay that like this doesn't make a ton of sense at all especially due to the universal Christian belief that everyone is a sinner and because everyone is a sinner nobody is safe from God punishing them if I mean, if you take that to the logical extreme, it's that nobody is safe from God punishing them. But I guess some sins are like, I get the feeling that they should just like ditch the God hates F slur and, and God hates the Jews signs and then just roll around with God hates everybody signs. Or they could do signs that say don't sin or God might kill somebody you've never met. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This like th that this is America. So like I feel like if they rolled around with that, that wouldn't be a motivating factor at all. Like, do you remember the movie The Box? I haven't seen it. It's a movie where there's a button where if you press it, you get a million dollars, but somebody you don't know dies. Ooh. Sometimes I feel like every single person in this country, if given that option, would just like be mashing that button all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like Yeah. Uh no, but like Dude, that's that. This belief is just so, just like I mean, it's it's Ugh. wild in that it's it's 
if they're out here saying, well, the world is sinful and that's why people, that's why people get sick and that's why people die and that's why people murder each other and that's why there's violence in the world that makes sense but yeah. they're saying well that's true but also especially if you do these things god kills more people like it that j that just seems so yeah extra biblical it's not even extra biblical it's like extraterrestrial and the whole like god kills people is really not up my alley like the idea of we live in a world that is both imperfect and sinful and therefore you know death comes into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men because all of sin like that works fine for me we live in a world where death is the natural consequence of life like like yeah death happens because not because people are bad inherently but because we live in a world that has been infected by sin that is fine for me but the idea that like God puts his magic finger of killing people down on the earth at random to get us and punish us, I, and that I don't like. And it's also, it, it seems like so designed to make people feel terrified and insecure. Because what if you, what, if, how, what would it be like to believe that no matter how good you were, no matter how hard you tried to serve God with your life, he still might just kill you to punish somebody else and not even like not even in a personal way just in a like i'm mad at this one person so let me just close my eyes and pick somebody at random to kill that just that seems like it would be a, a really horrible thing to believe but he already decided before the world was made who would die when and where and for what reason and right so it's, it's random I mean, but it's not it's random just, it's, it's, it's punishment but is that isn't it mm. it's not punishment if you d if you decided that it was going to it's just f it's it's a stupid belief it doesn't make any g sense one way or in in any way whatsoever it's not theologically sound we're yeah. telling you right now that it's not theologically sound <laughs> It's so just... I, I want to do a little bit more theology because they don't believe, because of all of this that we've just described, they don't believe that protesting is going to save any soul that hasn't already been chosen for salvation by God. So their signs say repent or burn, but they believe that only those who are elect are able to repent. So they say that they're protesting and street preaching to warn people about what will happen if they don't repent. But they also believe that 99.99999% of all people who ever see their signs or hear their preaching will not repent because they have been chosen by God as unable to repent because the vast majority of humanity was chosen by God to be unable to repent. So they're doing, uh, by their own theology, they're doing these protests even though they accept that there is very little chance that any of these protests will ever be effective. It's I mean, they're just kind of like ruiners then, I guess, even in their own minds. Or if it's just like, oh, you you um you went and you're like, oh man, I need to get a a new pair of shoes, and you go to the store and you get a new pair of shoes, and you're like, hey, look, I just got a new pair of shoes. And they're just like, Do you know the conditions in the sweatshop where the children made those shoes? Like every time you do anything, they're just like you know that that thing's bad, right? Right, and I think that is so a good analogy like a because, like, because yeah. you've already bought the shoes, you've already eaten the burger. They are not changing the outcome of what has already happened. They just want to make you feel bad about it because there's there's a total difference between lecturing somebody about something they've already done and trying to pull them over to your point of view. I mean, I have a theory about why they do these protests. And I'll get to that at the end of the episode. I'm excited to get back into this. So if you if you dig into Westboro member interviews, if you go past their FAQ page that shows the nicest version of their beliefs on things, the reason that they give for protesting or another reason that they give is to show people that God hates them. And I just, I don't get this theologically. And I know that's because theologically is not why they're out there holding offensive signs. But if they believe that basically no one outside their church slash family is going to heaven and they believe that god has predestined those who will go to heaven then there is no point in getting out there with signs about how god hates people other than trying to inflict emotional damage on people who are already going to hell because people having the awareness that god hates them in westboro's theology is not going to affect their salvation it is not going to make them change so that god can stop hating them 
unless they are already predetermined to be one of the elect whom God does not hate. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. I thought that was very Yeah, this is going to go in circles forever because it it doesn't make sense. (laughs) It doesn't make any sense. We're going to talk about some notable protests. Um, So as we've said earlier, they protested the funerals of many armed service members, most notably, uh, as I said earlier, uh, funeral of Matthew Snyder, which led to the Supreme Court case. They protested Jerry Falwell Sr.'s funeral which I find hilarious because Jerry Falwell Sr. and the Westboro Baptist Church have basically essentially have basically identical beliefs with regards to 9-11 being caused by the gays. <laughs> so that's a fun one. Uh, f- Jerry Falwell. F- the Westboro Baptist Church, too, as well, but also f- Jerry Falwell. One of the Westboro Baptist Church's biggest protests was, and this one, uh, TW for all for all of the 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 homophobia the the hate crimes and stuff they protested the funeral of matthew shepherd young man living in wyoming who was brutally murdered for being gay in 1998 and they were carrying signs that said god hates Fsler and matt is in hell not very cool that is that is absolutely terrible because matthew was he was really young and his murder was incredibly brutal and Actually, his his death made a difference in civil rights le- legislation. Legislation. They passed hate crime laws. Yeah. Because of the attention it got, um, if only he'd been able to see that in life. And that that is just that's a horrible, horrible funeral to protest of all of all of them. Westboro Baptist Church also protested the Holocaust Memorial in Washington D.C. I should note. Um, and, and we've mentioned this before, but Westboro Baptist Church is extremely anti-Semitic. They believe that God hates Israel and they view the Holocaust as divine judgment and divine punishment of the Jews for killing Jesus. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. but also their official position is that the Jews are the real Nazis, which is doesn't make a lot of sense. They're just like they protested a memorial for do you remember the the Sichuan earthquake in China in 2008 where 70,000 people died? Yeah. They claimed that China was ungrateful, that the Chinese people are ungrateful and they don't accept Jesus and that's why God did that. Uh Oh dear. Yeah. Not very cool. All of the members of Westboro Baptist Church were preemptively banned from Canada after they planned to protest a funeral there in 2008. Good job, Canada. Canada. Yeah, this this one very good job. Can it was it was just a person like it was a person who got murdered on public transit. Just um, but but Westboro wanted to protest it because like, see, this is the kind of thing that happens when you have a sinful country. And Canada was like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. In two thousand nine, Westboro announced their intentions to protest a performance of the Laramie Project in England. The Laramie Project is a play about the death of Matthew Shepard, which we mentioned earlier. After Westboro Baptist Church announced their intention to protest this event, Fred Phelps and Shirley Phelps Roper were preemptively banned from entering the UK. And all I have to say about that is that it's a shame that Stephen Anderson is banned from way more countries than they are. I think that Stephen Anderson and the Westboro Baptist Church should be banned from more countries. Yeah, so they also protested the funeral of Michael Jackson in 2009, um, and they came out with a parody cover remix of the song We Are the World. Oh, dear. And yeah, it's called God Hates the World. Oh, dear. But it also got them in copyright trouble. So <laughs> I, know, I remember listening to this because um, when, uh, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, uh, my choir sang in protest to the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, But we sang We Are the World in protest to their protest because they protested our school. I remember just endlessly clowning them for how trash their blend was on their their (laughs) rendition of it and how they got the rhythm wrong and they got all the syncopation wrong. You know, it's probably on purpose because syncopation is sinful. But the, the chorus goes, God hates the world and all her people you everyone will face a fiery day for your proud sinning it's too late to change his mind you've lived out your vain lies storing up god's wrath for all eternity that's how it goes (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, number one, that's an awful hateful message. But number two, that's just, it's not a very good parody. Like the syllables don't work really well. Um, I feel like I could make a better hateful Fundy parody song if I wanted to. The Westboro Baptist Church also has a song called Santa Claus Will Take You to Hell, which Santa seems... Santa Claus will take you to hell. More catchy, right? <laughs> yeah. So this brings us to counter protests, of which there have been many. Sadie and I have both, we both have stories of being protested by them, which is interesting. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. When I was at Hiles Anderson, there was a young man who had grown up in First Baptist Church of Hammond and attended Hammond Baptist High School and then grew up and joined the army. And he died in Afghanistan because of an IED. His funeral was held at First Baptist Church of Hammond in January of 2012, which was a surprise to me because my PTSD brain was absolutely sure that it was 2013. Um, and it's very weird to think that all of this happened before Scott went down. This funeral was a really big deal at First Baptist Church of Hammond. Uh, the governor of Indiana at the time was there and was one of the speakers. And we started hearing some rumors ahead of the funeral service that Westboro Baptist Church was coming to protest, which caused quite some disruption. And I think the fundies <laughs> maybe got it right for once here, because obviously Westboro's brand of absolutely hateful, offensive, hot garbage is something that doesn't belong at any funeral and something that no grieving family should ever have to see. It really says something when you are too hateful, even for the dyed in the wool IFB fundies. If the, if the IFB fundies think, oh no, you're way too hateful. So First Baptist Church's leadership's tactic was to do what they could to keep the protesters as far away from the funeral attendees as possible. I'm really grateful that I got to attend Sergeant Lenhart's funeral service. It was a really moving funeral, but there are two things that really stood out to me from that day. First was how cold it was, but the other thing was a biker group that does human shields to protect people from people like Westboro came in to counter protest and they protected the auditorium while the funeral was going on. The college, you know, it's Hiles Anderson College. We protect your girls, <laughs> right? Ironically, this is the one time I really felt like I was protected by the college. Uh, they had these biker guys escort the college girls from the buses to the church. So they dropped us off several blocks away from the church to try to avoid any protesters. And I don't think any were there. If, if they were, I didn't see them at the actual funeral. But we all had to wait on the buses to be walked into the church. Like each college girl would get an escort of two of these giant biker dudes. And I think that's just <laughs> such a fun... <laughs> It's a really fun mental image, just a bunch of Hiles Anderson girls in like dresses and heels and nylons getting escorted into the church by massive biker dudes in leather with like long beards. Uh, I remember the guy who walked me in was re the guy on my left was just really sweet and very, very low key, very somber, very respectful, but joking a little bit and just had a he had a really sweet personality. And then it turned out that the protest actually went down at the cemetery, which is kind of Westboro's MO. Since Sergeant Linhart was buried at Memory Lane Cemetery, which is private property, the police were able to keep the Westboro people completely on the other side of the road. I remember they sent the college girls home instead of letting us go to the cemetery because they didn't want us to see the protesters because their signs are so vulgar that, you know, can't have the good college girls' Christian eyes see that. <laughs> Which is so ironic, considering the continual failures of First Baptist Church and Hiles Anderson and the IFB at large to protect women. <laughs> they had us go home by a completely different route, so we wouldn't have to see the horrible protesters. Yeah. But yeah, that's my, that's my story regarding Westboro. I mean, props to First Baptist Church of Hammond, weirdly, because like the best way they've ever handled anything in the history of them handling things yeah i mean i don't know how you would handle the situation better than that that's yeah i mean that's like the ideal way to handle that situation is to just not engage with these people so westboro baptist church came to my high school in 2010 they protested across the street we were all like sadie we were all just told not to engage with them 
And then instead we had an all school assembly outside the auditorium, which was right across from where they were protesting. And, and I was in the choir at the time. So we sang, we are the world, but we could see them outside with their God hates Jews and like God hates F slur signs. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was interesting about this was how it felt like going up against like somebody who's like a real hate group who felt like they were there targeting us. It, it it felt like that had a real unifying power. Like I remember a lot of different social circles kind of like cross pollinating in the lead up to that event. So I guess it was kind of similar in regards to your experience with like big burly bikers escorting nice young little church ladies to <laughs> in, into the church, into the service. Yeah, there there's definitely a similar unifying effect. But why on earth were Westboro protesting some high school in Portland? Because it's Portland. Because that's where the libs are. Oh, okay. Yeah, say, it's the same. I mean, they'll just like show up anywhere and find something to hate. I mean, but it's also the same reason, like, you know, Proud Boys and Patriot Pair and the Three Percenters and all of like the fastest chud loser clubs decide to have like Trump parades. Sure. Blocking off our bridges. Yeah, just being absolute d the, no, the question is why they would they would pick Hiles Anderson, like a Hiles Anderson student to go to like a, a protest of all pro because like they're both independent Baptists. Uh, uh, Westboro Baptist is independent Baptist. So did he just take the secondary separation extremely seriously or did he think that Hiles Anderson were more likely to physically engage with his protesters? I, I like will tell you those some certain Hiles Anderson boys can get pretty fired up over certain things. Um, and there, I remember there being a lot of chapel announcements, like, if you beat up a Westboro Baptist Church member, you are going to get expelled. Do not do that. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't think this had a single thing to do with theology. I think that this event was picked because it was a military funeral and because it was going to be a big funeral held in a large venue with a lot of press coverage. And I guess when you're Fred Phelps, like, even the people close to your theology hate you. Um, but you can just go around and be a heel to everybody and the but the most important point here is that if you just piss everybody off like the fundies the libs even the racists to the point where i feel like almost this is like a sort of op like they're just grifting the whole time but we'll get into that later as well the only comp that i can think of is like steven anderson but steven Am anderson like seemingly goes way into the white nationalism angle that fred phelps doesn't and the main question that I kind of want to ask is if Fred Phelps was in it for real or if the whole thing was just for money. Now, these obviously aren't the only times that people have counter protested the Westboro Baptist Church. Sadie's uh, experience with the burly bikers uh, who protected the sweet, innocent church girls from having to see the signs with the vulgarity on them. With and the same slurs that we were hearing in sermons. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, my experience singing We Are the World at the Westboro Baptist Church, and they just kind of left because they couldn't come on school property because obviously they couldn't come on school property. They were just across the street. So on multiple occasions, various collectives of hackers have used uh, DDoS attacks to take down the Westboro Baptist Church's website. Um, I know Anonymous has done it once. Um, I think Anonymous did it after they protested the sandy hook funerals which ugh. oh my <sighs> god yeah protesting the sandy hook funerals that's you would fun. think something would be sacred to these people nothing sacred to these people um except for god's wrath westboro baptist church protested a foo fighters concert but the band's frontman legendary rock star dave grohl also the drummer from nirvana love dave grohl dave grohl counter protested by playing a song and and uploaded the video to youtube where it got more than four million views so good for you dave grohl well i love this is one of my favorite um counter protests <laughs> what the the dave grohl the the foo fighters the foo fighters one because you can see it on youtube and it's fun and everybody's just like they like what i said with the um with our protests like it seems like whenever the westboro baptist church shows up any anywhere like everybody no matter what they believe is like we're gonna show up to protest these like they don't care who you are we're all everyone just shows up to it doesn't matter what you believe you show up to protest the westboro baptist church it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what social circle you're in what you what religious group you're in, what like so what no matter like you show up to to 
In fact, when the Westboro Baptist Church protested the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, hundreds of people showed up to stand between the memorial and the picketers. So, good job, people. Good for people. Do you remember Kim Davis? Yes. The, the How clerk, can I forget? <laughs> she was the clerk who went to jail because she refused to grant a marriage license to the, the gay couple. Um, mm-hmm. Well, Westboro Baptist Church protested her because apparently she was an adulterer. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember that. <laughs> they do not give a single f- <laughs> I mean, yeah, and also they just want to be where the cameras are. Yeah, but also f- him, Davis. Yeah, but Oh God! Who? <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say f- the Westboro Baptist Church more, but like, I don't even know who's worse here. There are two sides of the same coin. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Do you want to do the one with the Satanic <clears throat> Temple? Because this one's funny. Sure, and just a tw. This is like offensive and blasphemous. It's fighting fire with fire kind of tactics. Just so you know, if that's not something you want to hear, that's totally fine. Um, my favorite sexy edge lord, Lucian Graves celebrated a pink mass over Fred Phelps' mother's grave, posthumously declaring her a lesbian. I still don't get why you find him sexy, because to me, he looks like he's been following, you know, Jordan Peterson's meat-only diet? Yes. He looks like he's, like, on Jordan Peterson's meat-only diet. I thought we had established (laughs) that I think he's handsome because he put a satanic spell on me. I think he put a satanic spell on the vest, and every time he wears it, he's sexy. (laughs) the vest it's his little (laughs) lesbian vest uh no uh, i need to make a disclaimer do not support everything that lucy and graves has ever done said or thought i literally just like to look at him with my eyeballs please do not come for me on the internet again um (laughs) (laughs) so the pink mass is a made-up ritual which includes candles and scripture reading and prayers to satan and same gender couples kissing over a previously straight person's grave in order to make them gay in the eyes of the satanic temple it 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 all comes down to so okay so that's the official story i have read accounts that it was maybe a little bit more sexual than that oh and or desecratory but that's not the official story so i'll stick to what i have sources for but it's about poking fun like the idea of making someone gay after their death like retroactively making somebody gay is poking fun at some of westboro baptist church's supreme court arguments and interpretations of religious freedom so the quote from graves is we believe that fred phelps is obligated to believe that his mother is now gay in the afterlife further if beliefs are inviolable rights nobody has the right to challenge our right to believe that Fred Phelps believes that his mother is now gay. <laughs> so you see like where like you see where he's going with this. Yeah. <clears throat> well like well we believe that Fred Phelps believes that his mother is gay and you can't make us change our belief. Religious freedom. <laughs> right. Like that's what they're trying to poke at with this um Okay, so show. Westboro Baptist Church, is it a cult? Is it a cult? We've talked about so many things in this episode that people assume correctly or incorrectly about Westboro Baptist or things that the church tries to obscure and things that they try to promote. One thing that outsiders definitely have right is when they assume that this is very much a high control group. I was talking about Lauren Drain's interview earlier. Lauren was not born into Westboro Baptist Church. Her dad joined after coming to make a documentary when she was about 16. And she was old enough that she really wanted to know all of the answers about why this new church believed what they said they believed. Lauren said in her interview that she became close with Shirley Phelps Roper and that she would go to Shirley with these questions. And Shirley would do a Bible study with her and try to really get in depth and explain these teachings. But if Fred caught wind of what was going on, like them doing their own Bible studies, he would say, stop talking about that. I don't know if I'm ready to preach on it or not. Uh. So it seems like the church doesn't have an official stance on any given thing until Fred has a stance on that thing. And that makes me think it was kind of a dictatorial, like his word is law situation. 
We mentioned that the Westboro Baptist Church only has about 70 members now and that most of the members are family or extended family of Fred Phelps. It's really unusual for someone like Steve Drain to come from outside and join the church. The actual rules of the church don't seem to be nearly as codified as the IFB rules. So, for example, nearly 100% of the IFB has a rule that women are only to wear long skirts, knee length or longer. And then you grow up, whatever group you grow up in, you know that group. So long in your group might mean the bottom of your knee or the top of your knee or mid-calf or fuller length or whatever. Because Westboro is only one church, they don't have as much of a need for that kind of codification in the rules. So when you read interviews with people who have gotten out, the focus isn't really on the rules. The focus is on the protesting and teaching of hatred to children. So on our podcast, I'm over here spilling about the nuance of all of the IFB rules around movies and TV and alcohol and curse words and skirt length. And that's not really what Westboro survivors are speaking about. And that makes me think that the rules were not the primary thing that they were teaching the children. I look through a lot of photos from protests, and you will certainly see women in long skirts in those photos, but you'd also see women in pants or longer loose shorts, and you'd also see men in knee-length shorts. So with all that information, I think the rules were pretty much just whatever Fred Phelps said they were at whatever given time. (laughs) I did hear on Lauren Drain's podcast that dyed hair, makeup, and manicures were not allowed. Those who are members spend extensive amounts of time attending protests. Even with only 70 members, the group spends as much as $200,000 to $250,000 per year on travel. They also pick it daily in Topeka, which makes me feel really bad for everyone who lives in Topeka. So while reading these interviews, I definitely saw signs of cult control. We had the quote I read from Lauren Jane earlier about being worried that God would do something to her, punish her personally for being so sinful as to get kicked out of the church. Another quote from Libby Phelps reads, Again and again, in sermons and private conversations, I was told that civilization outside of Westboro Baptist Church was made up of sinners, alcoholics, drug addicts, and lost souls with no moral compass. There was no gray area. You were either one of us or you were depraved and doomed. That definitely illustrates an us versus them thinking. So they presented dozens of small children with a binary choice. Follow every part of the teaching of this family and this church or be doomed. It's amazing that anyone ever gets out. I personally know how powerful it is to raise a small child with the idea that we are right and everyone else is wrong. But that's definitely high control. That's definitely cult Mm -hmm. control. Another thing that is indicative of cult control at Westboro Baptist is the fact that five out of the 13 Phelps children have become lawyers and work for uh, a law firm a family law firm that represents the church in all legal matters and is also the church's main source of revenue. So this is interesting because Westboro Baptist Church differs from the IFB in many ways. And one of the ways is that women actually do work outside the home in the Westboro Baptist Church. So, Like several of the children are lawyers, uh, as Sadie said, Fred Jr. is a lawyer. Margie Phelps is a lawyer. Shirley Phelps Roper is an attorney, and she is basically the church's main spokesperson. So do you remember when we did First Family Fundamentalism, we talked about David Gibbs and the CLA coming in to handle all of the public statements around First Baptist Church of Hammond after the Scoff scandal? Mm -hmm. Yep, that was there. They basically had an outside law firm to come and figure out what the public statements were, what the church's official position was, uh, how to do damage control. Basically, Westboro Baptist Church has so many lawyers in their family that they can just handle all of this in-house because their main spokesperson, Shirley Phelps uh, Roper, is a lawyer. From what I've read, and I've I've looked this up, and I've tried to dig into this, but this information isn't always readily available. They've all or many of them have worked for the Department of Corrections and worked with prisoners, just being the like they're the type of attorneys that go in and help prisoners like get their paperwork straight if they want to file a motion that sort of thing it's like the type of lawyers that jack scop would have been talking to when he wanted to get the judge 
to go easy on him because he, I guess, only molested a teenager because he had butthole rash or something or whatever. Westboro Baptist Church is involved with the law also due to them being basically if they get physically attacked during their protests or they're told that they can't protest or like in this case of Snyder v. Phelps, they got sued for protesting. They have ba- they can basically yeah. handle all of that sort of stuff in-house. And so if they need to sue somebody, then they don't have to pay an outside lawyer to sue that person for them. Oh, oh, this reminded me of something that I read in at least one, if not more, survivor interviews. These people talking about protesting on the picket lines with uh, Westboro Baptist Church as very small children and being hit with rocks and having scars from childhood, from having things thrown at them while doing their hate preaching thing. That really, that really hurt, honestly. I mean, you're using your kids as a human shield. In order to make money off of them. Yeah, but also, like, I can't advocate throwing rocks at adult hate protesters because I can't advocate violence and still run ads on my podcast. You know, personally, it wouldn't make me mad that mad if somebody did that. <laughs> but these are these are kids. They did not choose to be there. Yeah. These kids are being indoctrinated into a hateful way of life. And that just that that breaks my heart. Because the kids have their parents on one side, indoctrinating them into this and forcing them into this. And then they have the public on the other side who are rightfully angry about the hate that their church is spreading, but choose violence toward children and taking a... Like, I was so close to being one of those children. I grew up one step away from being one of those children. Those kids are real people who have the potential to get out. Like, please don't throw rocks at them. Yeah. The the one thing that I would like to say about that is also, though, that if you're bringing your children into a situation where you're like, maybe we'll get rocks thrown at us. And yeah, that's like don't a do that feature. Either. That's like a feature, not a bug. Yes. The, I mean, you 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 bear e- at least equal responsibility for whatever happens in that situation, um, especially if you're protesting a, a military person's funeral. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad you said that because the, the responsibility does also fall on the parents who woefully f- failed to keep their children safe. I don't want to make it out that, that the only responsibility is on the rock throwers. But please don't throw rocks at children like they give them a chance to to get out. So basically what they do is they get sued for protesting or they get injured while protesting or they get told that they can't protest or whatever. And then they go to court and they get a settlement for whatever. And that's how they generate money. It's such a weird money making scheme for a cult. Like, I've seen I Gave It All. I've seen Ponzi schemes. I've seen selling artifacts and photos of the cult leader. I've seen running a cafe, running a hotel. But this is one I've never really heard before. (laughs) Definitely a little bit unusual. The You know how I kind of see this almost? You know how in the IFB they have the, oh, well, there's a guy that's a contractor that's a member of our church. And so now he's the go-to contractor for everyone that goes to the church. Mm-hmm. Or like that with, you know, Brother Johnson, I had my my shoe broke the other day and I took it to Brother Johnson's shoe repair place and he repaired my shoes. And if you need your shoes repaired, go see Brother Johnson. He li- uh, His shop is on 12th and Main Street. Jack Hiles mm-hmm. doing that kind of thing. I see I see that it's like, th- but it isn't just like a member of the church. It's fully under the church's family umbrella. It's right. It's this just is like, more than a cult, in my opinion. It's it's really more along the lines of a family cult, which is a little bit different. It's very weird. The other thing that is extremely culty about Westboro is the complete shunning of ex members. Multiple ex members have said things like, I'm dead to them, or if they passed me in the grocery store, they would pretend I was a stranger. There is no contact allowed between current members and shunned ex-members. Lauren Drain's story about this absolutely broke my heart. She was kicked out of the church at 21 years old. And she describes the scene immediately after. She is crying and begging to be let in. What would I have to do to come back? I'm so sorry. And her mother was crying and her dad was not emotionally reacting to that at all which is creepy um lauren was dropped off at a motel and by the time she returned to pick up her things from her parents house a week later her three-year-old sister who she had raised and loved from birth was mocking her and laughing at her tears when asked several years yeah um 
There is there's another article that I've linked in the notes for this episode where Lauren's younger brother Boaz is like a little kid, like four or five, six years old, talking to an interviewer, and the way he speaks is just absolutely chilling. Like, no, I yes, I think you're going to go to hell because you have not accepted God's grace and you will burn forever and ever. Like that kind of thing from a tiny child. Man. I, this is this is totally me spitballing, me sharing my opinion, but I feel like maybe the Drain family had to be a little bit more fanatical even than people who were related to Fred Phelps in order to feel accepted at the church. When asked several years later if he missed his daughter, Steve Drain answered, Why would I miss her? Lauren's mother, Lucy, chimed in. She chose a life that is contrary to the scriptures. Wow. Yeah. There is a <sighs> possible happy ending to that story, believe it or not. Um, not only did Lauren get out of the church, write a memoir about her life and her time in the church, and build a incredibly successful social media career for herself, but Steve Drain and the Drain family were reportedly excommunicated from Westboro Baptist Church in 2021. And there, it is possible that Lauren is working on reunification with her family. I saw online that she did a YouTube video talking about reunification, but I wasn't able to find that YouTube video with the time that I had to go through her content. So I can't 100% confirm it because I didn't see it with my own eyes, but I've heard that they have since been reunited and are working on their relationship again. Question. What is Westboro Baptist Church like with regards to censorship of media? It doesn't seem like they do much, actually. Interesting. Yeah, we got an email from Leaving Eden special correspondent, Will, and an article that he shared with us said that Westboro Baptist Church children watch South Park, watch pretty much whatever they want because they don't believe in censoring that from children. Hmm. I mean, that makes sense, right? The things that they have their children yelling on picket lines, what South Park compared to that? <laughs> right. And also, if you feel like your if if your whole basis for your cult is we're the only ones going to heaven and God decided that before the world was even created, then you're not at risk for demons coming out of the TV because they said a bad word or something and infecting your children and making them not love Jesus anymore. Like right. that's there's, there's no IFB risk for that because you've basically just indoctrinated them into enough hate that they're like, yeah, like what they're going to learn bad words from South park, not anything they don't hear on the picket line, but they're going to, they're going to learn hateful attitudes from some, no, <laughs> there's, I guess there's just nothing to worry about when you're already raising your children so deep within hate. Yeah. So speaking of that hatred, one of the most famous ex-Westboro members is Megan Phelps Roper, the daughter of Shirley Phelps Roper. Megan has fairly recently taken a very hard turf turn. Boo. So I want to be careful. Yeah, we, we have to disavow that, obviously. I would say that her TED Talk, which came out over six years ago, is still worth a critical listen. She talks about building bridges between yourself and people who you consider to be unreasonable. And mm, maybe I would say she's a little too easy on people who you would consider to be unreasonable or hateful, which is probably how she ended up involved with TERFs. But I, I, th I think with a, a critical ear, it's still worth listening to. And also her experience with people being unreasonable and hateful is she's got to just her tolerance for that has got to just be completely out of whack just because of how she was raised yeah and it's it's really unfortunate the way that she's decided to use her public platform now but that doesn't necessarily mean something that she said six or seven years ago is 100 percent wrong when it's not on the same topic the things I wanted to pull out of Megan's story are what broke her out so Lauren Drain got out because she was kicked out Libby Phelps got out because she knew she was gay and she had to find a way out. Megan had much more of a, I think, a charmed life within Westboro. She happened to be 
a cishet woman who is the granddaughter of the pastor, so I think she could have more easily stayed for the rest of her life. And her mother was also like basically the, the public, basically, yeah, 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 the the whole PR person for the church. So she was she was born into a very high level position. So she would have, I would think she would have more reason to stay than Lauren or Libby. Megan was able to escape because of normal, mostly kind or civil interactions on Twitter that caused her to ask, quote, how had the other come to such outrageous conclusions about the world? She said that her Twitter contacts took time to dig into the teachings of Westboro Baptist Church and find inconsistencies and gently ask her about those inconsistencies. She says, quote, I had this unshakable faith and it had been shaken. What I think is is worthwhile about Megan's TED Talk is the way that people were able to help her undo a lifetime of brainwashing. I think it's wild that she got out because of things that people were saying in Twitter threads and like people were saying to her on Twitter. Like that's truly crazy to me because I've never thought of Twitter as anything other than a place to go and either just like post or just like yell at people who are. Yeah. These Twitter interactions that she was having, like we would have been like 2021 that these, these, the time that these were happening in 2011, 2012, 2013. So I guess it would have been a different, was a different place back then, perhaps. Yeah, it, I was on Twitter during that time, and it was a very different place than it was like post fi- uh, 14, 15, 16. Mm-hmm. I do think the way that she describes her mind being changed is worthwhile. But instead of recommending her memoir because of you know her being a turf, I want to recommend instead the YouTube series Gender Critical by Kellen Conrad, which very convincingly lays out evidence for the gender critical movement being cult like or even a cult it offers ideas on deprogramming people from that it's a three-part video series and each episode is like two hours long and i do not watch long youtube videos unless it's fundy fridays but i am still telling you that this is worth watching i would just like to say that it's the official position of the leaving eden podcast that turfs monkey balls and they all have main character syndrome and they need to get the f- over themselves so, <laughs> so leading up to his death in 2014 fred phelps was removed from leadership and eventually excommunicated from his own church his grandson nate phelps claimed that there was an internal power struggle between shirley phelps roper and a board consisting of all married men within the church what exactly happened isn't clear. Um, frustratingly, Westboro Baptist keeps their internal dealings under much better wraps than, say, Stephen Anderson, our other love to hate hate preacher. <laughs> this is not a, a transparent organization, it's... right? Like they're <laughs> these they're not messy the way that other fundies are messy. Like Jack Hiles mess is all over the internet <laughs> twenty years after he died. Steven Anderson's mess is there's leaks out of Steven Anderson's church all the time. Jack Hiles kept his mess under wraps for like decades, though. Yeah, but it, not permanently. Yeah. yeah, he just like went so far with a couple of things that it was like, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was just like, well, I can keep anything under wraps, even right. like. <laughs> yeah, he, he thought his power was more than yeah. it was. Or even like, okay, like Jill Rodriguez, she posts every thought that she ever has on the internet, and it's really easy to put two and two together and figure out what's going on in her family. Westboro is unfortunately not like that. I would love to know more about their mess, but it was just not something I was able to find. I assume that's because they're all lawyers. And they know- They're all lawyers, they're all related, and there's only 70 of them. Yeah, I mean, I assume that, like, because they're all lawyers, like, they know you can only, you can't say XYZ thing in public because that opens you up to liability, or you can say this, or you can't say that, or, and because they're all lawyers, they all know the laws and the rules of their internal politics probably very well. And they're also so single minded. Like, this is what we believe, this is what we do. They, they don't have multiple focuses. So if, if someone from Westboro gives an interview to anybody, 
it's going to be like, here's who we are, here's what we believe, here's why we protest. Let me say some offensive things. And the the in, an interview is not going to deviate from that. So the only sources that we have for this power struggle or what happened with Fred Phelps at the end of his life are <clears throat> children of his who had left the church and were somehow getting information from inside the church, even though they were technically supposed to be shunned. So some have said that this conflict before Phelps' death happened because he wanted to promote more compassion towards members of their church or that he wanted to promote more compassion towards the public. We do know that the content of Weird. Westboro's protest signs has shifted slightly since the time of his death. We still see all the old hateful classics, uh, you know, God hates this, that, and the other, but we also see signs highlighting the love of God in Westboro's very twisted way have appeared as well. Interesting. Yeah, so they will have a sign that says God hates whoever they're protesting that day. But they will also have a sign right next to it that says God loves the elect. So in their twisted way, they have added, um, notably, signs did not mention the name of Jesus very often before this kind of 2013, 2014 time period. And since then, more signs have been added. So they didn't take away any of the old classics. But they added new signs that appear just slightly more compassionate, even though they're really not. That's just, that's a little goofy, though. That, I mean, that maybe Fred Phelps came to the realization that people who aren't Westboro Baptist Church might also possibly be elect, maybe. So, uh. according to Megan Phelps Roper, Fred Phelps had possibly dementia or was a bit senile shortly before his death like in the year ish before his death and he did things like stepping across the street to pro lgbt ad activists who were putting up signs and painting a house across the street and said to them you're good people wow so was he what happened there did he think they were another did he think they were somebody else did he not understand what they were doing did he have just enough of a change of heart that he would look at those people and think you know they're fighting for something just like i'm fighting for something even though i hate the thing they're fighting for but i appreciate you know i can respect that they're doing something that they believe in or was he betraying that he didn't really hate gay people that bad all along of course knowing this incredibly hateful man i would say that it <laughs> that it was the first option he was not mentally well enough to understand who they were and what they were doing. But Megan says that this was one of the evidences that he was going soft. And that's um, what convinced the church that God had put a curse on him in his old age. And that's why he got excommunicated from his own church. Uh, according to Nate, Phelps spent his last days or months completely cut off from his community, visited only for people to bring him food or necessities and lived alone in the front room of a house with cameras on him constantly for his safety until he was placed in hospice care at the end of his life. Of course, the church elders deny that any of this ever happened. And regardless of whether or not he had a bit of a deathbed change of heart, getting excommunicated from his own church on his deathbed is so well-deserved. It's not nearly all Fred Phelps deserved, but he w it was definitely well deserved, and that brings me joy. Also, according to his own Calvinist belief of perseverance of the saints, that ostensibly, by his own theology, means that that he was never one of the elect, never one of the saved to begin with, and that he is in fact not in heaven right now. Um, he right. is in fact, yeah, being tortured for all eternity in a literal hell with like flames and a lake of lava and uh, uh, little red demons with tails and poking <laughs> spears. Yeah, and... that's that idea is what would have given the church t a reason to excommunicate him if Megan's story is correct. Both Megan yeah. and Nate had already left the church at the time that this happened. So they would have to be getting information from somebody inside, and we can't know how accurate that is. Yeah. Tough break. There should have been nicer to people. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, there's okay. just, 
I'm glad that I'm glad that he's dead because as I've said multiple times on this podcast, um I like to keep the list of people that I truly hate really, really, really small. There are lots of people that I don't like, but I like to keep the list of people that I actually I feel anger when I hear their name because I don't want to let them live rent free in my head. I don't want to be focused on the things I hate or the people that I hate 24 7. That's not healthy. So I'm kind of glad that Fred Phelps is dead because that means I don't have to give him a slot on my list. <laughs> I want to talk about whether or not I think Fred Phelps is a grifter or whether or not he's a true believer because this Let's is a game that we like to play. Yeah. Um, and I'm anxious to hear what you think about this, but I have kind of a take on this here, um, if you don't mind. Sure. So if you're a, like, a regular listener, you'll remember back several months ago around the time we uh, reviewed Ginger Duggar of Wello's book, uh, Becoming Free Indeed. We spoke about Calvinism um, basically as a precursor to that because Ginger uh, and, and Jeremy are Calvinists. So when we talk about five point Calvinists, as, as Sadie said earlier in the episode, one of the or one of the aspects that we talk about is uh, the you, which means unconditional election. This means God decided before everybody was born whether or not they would be saved and go to heaven or whether they would be damned and go to hell. And throughout a person's life, there isn't anything that they can do or say to change that because the outcome is already determined. So as part of that discussion, I posited a theory that taking Calvinist beliefs and combining them with hardcore fundamentalism and then taking that to the logical extreme could result in a specific worldview. And in this worldview, the unsaved or those who are not elect are dehumanized by those who believe that they are elect. And if somebody is dehumanized to a great enough degree, then they can be exploited, treated like dirt, whatever, whatever you do to that person is now fine because you're going to heaven and they aren't. So they don't matter. Earlier, Sadie asked why would you protest when it has no effect on anybody's salvation and i think that this is possibly the answer because the protests are only there really to goad people into an emotional and possibly violent response so that you can sue them and take their money this is why i think that the westboro baptist church would do a combination of lgbtq hate and protesting military funerals because they were tr like trying to piss off as many people as possible across the political spectrum, across the religious spectrum, and thereby give yourself as many potential marks for your scam as possible. It's the same as like the civil rights litigation. It's only there. He would only like take that case because he wanted to make money because the people who you are representing doesn't matter and the people who you're representing them against don't matter either. And you're going to heaven and none of the other people are going to heaven. So nothing that you do or your motivations for doing those things matter at all. As long as you can make a buck and you can live out your life on earth, the morality of anything that you do is completely irrelevant because when you die, you're going to go to heaven and everybody else is going to go to hell. So I truly and honestly think that this belief and the philosophy that this is the philosophy behind the Westboro Baptist Church's antics. So when we ask, is this person a grifter or is this person a true believer? The answer is that both of those two things are one and the same because the belief is the thing that justifies the grift. That is a really interesting take. Yeah, I think that there's another piece of corroborating evidence of this. So do you remember in my uh, biography section of Fred Phelps? when he essentially cut his father out of his life because he didn't feel that his father was devout enough because his father got remarried. Yes. So at age 17, this dude cuts his dad out of his life, never looks back. This is something that you only do if other people just don't matter to you. If like they literally, if like their existence, like they almost feel like they're NPCs and you're the main, like, and you're the, the, the playable character and everyone else is an NPC. Just to just to clarify, you're saying not that cutting your parents off is something you do if you think other people don't matter, but cutting them off because you think they're doing a sin. Yeah, or just like being willing to. I'm not saying that there's no yeah, reasonable there are reason to cut your yeah. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page. Right, because there's plenty of valid reasons why. I mean, dude, we're, we're, this is Pride Month, man. There's plenty of like unfortunately. Uh, 
if if I were going to say, oh, there's no valid reason to cut your parents out of your life, I couldn't like I, I wouldn't say that, especially not during Pride Month, because I know that there's so much stuff that so many members of that community have gone through and they don't have relationships with their parents anymore for. Right. If your parents are un, unsafe yeah. or if, if there is not a viable chance right now of you having a safe relationship with them. And that's a point of pain for a lot of people. I'm saying that but like, cutting them off because you think they're doing a sin is totally different. Yes. That's, I mean, that's something that you, especially at age 17 and especially if it's your parent, the, the level of like, it's not just, oh, I'm brainwashed and I'm legalistic. The, there has to be another aspect of, I don't give a shit about this person on top of that. So I do want to add something to that though. So at age 17, his father divorced and remarried and he cut his dad off permanently for the rest of his life because of that. Yes. Don't you think that having done something that drastic at such a young age would in fact intensify your faith and add to your beliefs as you continue to grow up? Yeah. <clears throat> so then I think you're so. so you do that at 17 and then a few years later you're 21, you're 25. And the tiniest little doubt of a maybe I should moderate my beliefs pops into your head. But then you think to yourself, well, I've already cut my father off for this belief. I've already changed my life drastically for this belief. And if I went back on it, that would be embarrassing. If I went back on it, everybody would know. I'd have to admit to being wrong. I'd have to feel the internalized shame of changing maybe it's better to just continue on in these beliefs yeah and also i think that when we talk to so many people who are raised in fundamentalism and they're like well what was the thing that got you out they were like well there was somebody that i knew and they were x y or z thing that my religion teaches me is wrong but I met them and I didn't think they were a bad person. If you're out here just like, oh, this person's doing a sin, I'm cutting them off. Oh, this person's doing a sin, I'm cutting them off. Oh, this person's doing a sin, I'm cutting them off. Like if you're out here just doing that with everybody, then that's going to cut out any potential moderating right, voice. Right, you never have the opportunity to have well. that experience. Yeah, I mean he's I mean you're basically practicing information control and the in-group out-group thing on yourself. It's worth noting here for me that we you know, and I, I, I spoke on this earlier, is that we received emails from listeners who are brought up with Calvinist beliefs, and these beliefs ranged from beliefs that were kind of similar to IFB fundamentalism to beliefs that I wouldn't really particularly describe as harmful at all. So there's like definitely a, a wide range of that. And as far as like Calvinism goes and with any religious doctrine, like we said, there are extremists and there's fundamentalists and there's also good people. So if you're I mean, if you're interested in this topic, you can go back and check out episode 117, where we talk about Calvinism. Episode 119 is when we review Ginger Duggar's book. And episode 121 is when we talk about the listener responses to Ginger's book and, and to Calvinism. But that's kind of my take. I, I think that really the, the religion and the grift and the belief and the grift are one and the same. The, I mean, it's, it's like you were saying with the kid who was just like a like literally a little kid being like yeah you're going to hell mm -hmm. you're gonna burn forever in a lake of fire and there's nothing you can do about it yeah and none of the grown children of fred phelps or adult grandchildren who have left have ever said anything about there being a you know we say this one thing in in public but when we're in private you know we kind of joke around a little bit or, or we all know it's not really real there, nothing like that has, I, I have not found anything like that said by any of the grown children and grandchildren who have left. No, the only thing that we've heard that's like different in public and private is Fred Phelps' racism and his yeah. uh, civil rights litigation career versus what he actually felt about racial minorities and what he would say in private about them. So I feel like the grift, the religion making the grift and the grift making the religion, it all being tied up in one thing is kind of the only way that it that this story makes sense because like i i think i feel like i've said this before if he wanted to make a bunch of money and make a lot of people mad he could have done that just as well as a lawyer without ever bringing religion into it or without ever bringing hate speech into it 
if he just wanted to be an eccentric prophet-like figure who made everybody mad and was really well known but there wasn't a financial side to it he could have done that perfectly well without there being a financial element and just opened up his beliefs a little bit more to get more hateful people to join a big church and then give the church enough money for the church to survive and do their stuff the only you know there are ways to get rich that are not drifting money off of lawsuits when you get sued for being a horrible asshole. and there are ways to get famous that are not being the biggest soul in the world the only reason that a person would need to do both of those things together to get rich and famous by being the biggest asshole in the world is that it's all connected in their mind does that make sense no that makes perfect sense so i want to finish this with a positive pride story but before i do that i have a special treat for our listeners i have uh requested and received personal permission from mr michael dean dameron to play you a clip of his song (laughs) fred phelps and the westboro baptist church this song brings me so much joy so i think we can um play that clip now and then i'll read you a really nice pride story and then we'll finish up this episode Usually I don't take great um, um, happiness in folks dying because we're all going to get there and it's all good and well with that sh- But uh, this here's an asshole from Topeka, Kansas who's brought a lot of misery to the world. And I'm not going to take the high ground on this. I'm just going to say a big f*** you and uh, I hope you die quick, you're a prick. Now, f- Fred Phelps in the Westboro Baptist Church. Well, that was fun. That was, um, it's it's a nice palate cleanser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, do you want to read this pride story? I read the one. I'll at read the this pride you can story. Read this one. Yeah. So. This story is from Frankie. He says, Today I listened to your Michael and Debbie Pearl episode. I've heard your call for LGBT stories before, and I thought about writing something. Oh, I thought about writing, but something about Sadie talking about her inability to think for, of herself when making decisions or even to know what wanting feels like really hit me. I am a bisexual transgender man, and I was raised in the Mennonite tradition. A lot of Sadie's upbringing feels extremely familiar to me. I feel like only now in my late 30s am I understanding some of the impacts of such a restrictive childhood. I don't remember not knowing I was a boy. I do remember the day I realized that I was just going to have to pretend and go along to get along. I was in second grade. I had severe panic attacks during middle school, which my doctor pointed out as the exact timing of puberty, which makes sense now, but I didn't know that at the time. I was having a debilitating panic attack at least five to six times a week. I didn't know what a panic attack was and i didn't know anyone else had ever had one that mm -hmm, i've experienced that one frankie yeah when you it, it is that's a tough one my information about the world was pretty limited therapy wasn't ever mentioned and certainly would not have been allowed the only thing i knew to do was pray i became an expert people pleaser i mean my whole life was a performance so why stop there i was married at age 20 and as sadie pointed out Often you end up in a domestic abuse situation because you are so used to having others make decisions about your life. It's hard to spot controlling behavior when you have never not been under someone else's control. We had two children together and when I was 30, I finally left. Leaving the abusive relationship really helped me deconstruct a lot of my faith and question things I'd never questioned before. I feel like religious influence combined with my transness really came together to create a world where I wasn't living my life. I was allowing others to make decisions on my behalf. Some of those decisions, like the marriage, are still affecting me negatively to this day. It really frustrates me when I hear people talking about queer people grooming children because I feel like I was groomed by the church. Groomed to be straight and cis and a submissive sweet wife. It took until my 30s to even be able to ask what I actually liked or wanted or who I even was. I feel as though I just followed a script. I remember when I was starting to think about coming out. There was a census and when they came to the door, one of the questions was your gender. The worker was great. He didn't look at me and pick a gender. 
He asked me, and no one had ever done that, and I couldn't answer him. I kept thinking, well, I know I'm a man, but I also know I'm supposed to say woman. It just felt so at odds. Eventually, I said, just write woman, it's fine. <laughs> but it wasn't fine. I came out publicly a couple weeks after this experience. Congratulations, Frankie. To, yes. to leave on a happier note, I've been out about my gender for two years now, been taking testosterone for almost 18 months, and I've never felt better. Recently, I've even started passing and rarely get misgendered anymore. It, feel, it feels like the hormones are not just a way to look more like myself, but medicine that helps my brain function. It's a powerful antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication. I don't know how I did anything before. I've never felt better in my body and my spirit. I have wonderful friends and even a fantastic boyfriend. It turns out gender dysphoria doesn't just go away with time. It is possible to live a happy, anxiety-free life. Thanks for all you do. Listening feels extraordinarily cathartic. And that's from Frankie. Hell yeah, Frankie. Thank you, Frankie. Love it. That, that was such a nice story to end this tough episode on. Congratulations on being on the T, man. Yeah. And I feel strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've heard. And congratulations for uh, knowing what to answer the next time a census comes up. Yeah. Well, thank you so much true. for the story. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. In a couple of days, either Thursday or Friday is when it's coming out. Uh, you're listening to this episode now in the, the the day that we're recording this is the day before the Shiny Happy People documentary drops. The one with all of our friends in it, including Fundy Fridays, Heather Heath, a bunch of other people that you don't even know that we're friends with yet, but you're about to find out. Yeah, Um. so we're having our episode coming out all about it's either going to come out on thursday or friday whenever we um finish recording it and then i finish editing it and as soon as that happens i'm going to drop it just because like yeah we got to watch the documentary we got to find a time with some special guests to hang out and then we've got to gobby's got to edit the episode but it will come out as soon as possible and hopefully before next week's episode. Yes. Um, and we're going to get that out to you, but that's going to come out on either Thursday or Friday this week. And then next week, if you're a fan of the Netflix show Queer Eye, which I am, Sadie is, everybody should be because it's like the ultimate comfort content. It's just like kindness content. And, and emotionally resonant kindness content. Uh, we got one of the heroes one of the people who got made over on an episode of Queer Eye, he is a gay pastor in the Philadelphia area. He, he's up in Fishtown and in uh, North Philadelphia. His name is Pastor Noah Hepler. You know him from season five, episode one of Queer Eye. The episode title is Preaching Out Loud. And we have him. Uh, we recorded this uh interview with him like a week ago it's fantastic one of the best episodes that we've ever done i think personally and we're gonna have that episode coming out next week so make sure that you subscribe to the show and and tune in for that because that's going to be fantastic that's going to be a ton of fun and we've got more fun stuff coming up for the rest of pride month make sure you check out our merch that we have that goes to benefit the lgbtq community the pride merch that we have uh proceeds from that all go to to, to benefit that community if you like the show, if you're the fan of the show, then you can follow us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram and uh, TikTok at Leaving Eden Podcast. Join our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, and our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Sadie, socials? You can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music on Twitter at Hell Yeah Sadie, and on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, um, I mean, Instagram is the only one I really use these days at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.